Hello and welcome to Noises Were Made, a music-based podcast where we're connecting our passions in life to the people that make it happen. Thank you once again for joining us on another episode. This is episode number five. We're going to be talking about what makes up a guitar today. If you haven't listened to any of the other episodes, we're covering AI, in music, the music industry itself, and some just general conversations. So please go check out the other episodes. But this week, let's get stuck into the guitar. So thanks for listening to this episode. We're going to get straight in with the history of guitar. And probably best to start with my history of it. So playing the guitar, I picked up the electric guitar when I was 12 years old. Before that, I just simply was a bit too small to play it. There wasn't as many options out there as there is nowadays in terms of sizing. Uh, So the only option really was an acoustic other than an electric. And the practice back then was always learn on an acoustic. And once you've learned on an acoustic, then you might be able to play on an electric. However, that wasn't necessarily what we would do nowadays. You'd probably just learn on electric and then you can transpose your skills to a classical or an acoustic. So... Because of that, I played other instruments like violin or clarinet. And it wasn't until that stage that I went into music. Luckily for me, it was around sort of early 90s. And you had bands like Guns N' Roses, Nirvana, along with all the heritage like Hendrix, ACDC, Zeppelin, and all those bands producing music, all led by musicians, written by musicians, not only performing to um, crowds of that specific genre. But a lot of that music was made, making its way into you know, popular music. So the chart music, the radios, the shows, you, you were hearing instruments being played. And you, you know, look at Michael Jackson. He had guitar solos on lots and lots of his very, very successful songs. It, it, it was just something that was always there, even if it wasn't necessarily an obvious rock band or guitar-based or instrument-based band. So that's really what predicated me picking up the guitar. And the first guitar I ever got was a Stratocaster. Not massively fond of the Strat itself uh, as I've got older, but that was the one I gravitated to originally. It was the easiest to get on with and probably the most versatile of all the guitars. Moreover, because of the pickup selections, it had uh, what we call an HSS, so that was two single coils and one humbucker. But that meant you had lots of different styles available of sound. And so as a learner guitar, probably a really great place to start because then you get a feel for what you like and what you don't like. More often than not, like everything, we have an idea in our head of what we want to be. But then when it comes to it and we try it out, it's not always uh, it's not always what we had imagined it. I mean, it pretty much goes for everything in life, doesn't it? So, a quick history, if it will, on the guitars themselves. A lot of people would associate them with the lute, in particular, the amount of strings and the way it's sort of that type of strung and played instrument. But what a lot of people won't realise is the modern guitars, we might know it, was really from more like the Spanish, uh, I think it's sort of vihuela or vihuela. Uh, sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong or butchering that. But that was in, in Spain around the 16th century. So that's like 1580s, around that sort of the late, the late 16th century. And that actually had layers of strings rather than what we know now. It actually had different layers of strings. And these layers of strings were tuned C, F, A and D. Fast forward to the 19th century, so that's like the 1800, 1801, etc., by then, we'd adapted to having a flat structure. So rather than four layers of strings, we had one layer of strings and we had all six strings. E, A, D, G, B, and E. I forgot that then. But that's, that's I won't say the entomology, but that's like the base, very, very stripped down version. Go have a look. There's loads on Wiki and loads on various other sites out there about the actual history of guitar and where it came from. But essentially from that kind of lute scenario and then it was the Spanish 
and the way that they constructed the guitar that really sort of brought prominence. You do have big steps in the, the making and the production and that certainly came to fruition not only with the bracing of a guitars like from Martin where they put a, a giant bracing on the back of a, an acoustic guitar to improve the sound projection and the stability of the sound hold but also from the electrification and the electrification came the electric guitar fundamentally now electric guitars although had been around and you had semi sort of guitars in like the jazz players in the 30s and some 40s although there were patents out for those sort of things what you're really most people herald is the first proper electric guitar is the Fender Esquire which many may recognize as looking like a Fender Telecaster the only difference is it had one pickup which was at the bridge and that's sort of towards the back so there wasn't a front pickup now that came out in 1949 and the reason that a lot of people herald that is that the first main one is because it was really the first mainstream production guitar that they were making more than one off or it wasn't just a custom modification so that's that's really why it's held it that way and following on from 49 in 1950 they actually made a, a two pickup version of that Esquire so that then became what we now look like as a Telecaster but in fact the name was Broadcaster at the time there was something very similarly named from Gretsch to do with drumming and they argued it and managed to argue that getting the name changed so the guitar went nameless and the rest of like 1950 until mid 1951 I believe the guitars that came out were actually had no name written on them and they're always referred to now historically as no casters because they were supposed to be a broadcaster and they then they've turned into the telecaster but for that period they had no name as you can imagine we're talking 1950 to 1951 they weren't selling the volumes that they were nowadays despite what the collection <laughs> despite how many uh, are out there apparently that are original uh, it was said somewhere that although the 2000 or whatever it was famous year one guitars that were made only 6,000 have been found or something silly like that so there are a lot of copies and a lot of clones and some relics uh, that are so well done that like anything in art the guitars themselves are, are a piece of artwork and unless you've got one or you picked one up and you've seen something of high quality you don't necessarily appreciate it but because they are such a piece of artwork that's why people have a connection with it but we'll get into that in a bit so as it stands Fender came out 1949 then 1950 with the broadcaster which then 51 became the telecaster then they brought out a bass guitar at the P bass which is still out there is still quite famous and the Strat was the Stratocaster as many know 1954 1959 came the Jazzmaster 1962 came the Fender Jaguar and then some big changes happened within Fender as a company In 1965 they sold the company to a, a company called CBS and they had that company from 1965 right through to 1984 when they sold it now one of the interesting parts was that when CBS finally sold Fender they had to move from their original factory which was in Fullerton and they had to move across to, to Corona so there's a time period where all the original guitars were built right up until it's rumored around 89 was almost the cutoff year because although 1985 was when CBS was sold, there was a moving period from Corona, Fullerton to Corona, should I say. But also, what we mustn't forget fundamentally is that Fender is and always has been a parts company. They manufacture parts. 
So whenever you see a Fender guitar, it's made up of a mass of components, all put together. But those components individually are produced en masse. So they will make a thousand necks, a thousand bodies, a thousand pots, a thousand switches, etc., etc. And the price that you pay for the guitar is usually based on the quality of the components that are used and also the amount of time that people have had their hands on it in the factory. So one of the more budget ends may be some of the simpler woods or the cheaper woods or the cheaper finishes or the lower quality components. And the higher end would obviously be the higher end components, the very costly woods, and they would have top level experts who not only put the guitars together but some of them do specific relic jobs or very specific custom jobs in the master build series so that's where you have such a wide range of pricing for guitars but fender's one one of the main big ones fender required gretch another big company some many years back so when they did that they also own companies like squire who were always considered the budget version of Fender. And there's other companies, Bixby, Jackson, etc., that Fender own. But their main counterpart in, in the industry, the, the Adidas to the Nike, so to speak, is uh, Gibson. So Gibson had been around since 1900, 1902, I think. And they actually were predated by Epiphone, who are their budget arm or lower cost, more affordable arm, should we say. So when Gibson came out with their electrics and really started pushing them, it was 1952 that they really struck the, the right note. And that was with the Les Paul, famously played by Les Paul. This guitar then led to, in, in 58, Gibson bringing out the ES335, the Flying V and the Explorer. So that was quite a big year for Gibson themselves bringing out very, very new designs. 61, however, they made what some might say is a fatal mistake. They made what is refer not referred to, what is known as the Gibson SG. But that idea was supposed to be a Les Paul with two cutouts. And the cutout, for those who don't know on the guitar, is where you you have a half moon circular shape that you can slide your hand up into to get access higher up the strings. Now there was a call for a double cutaway similar to what the Stratocaster had. So Gibson's response was to make the SG, which is a has two horns fundamentally. But in doing so, they dropped the, the Les Pauls. So there's no Les Pauls made between 1961 and 1967 they don't exist and it wasn't until 1968 that they realized the les paul was actually popular in its own right and they brought it back just the same as when they had the jazz master it was supposed to replace the you know the surfy version that was the, the the future of music apparently at the time that was going to replace the strat it didn't it just became a, a cousin well, product or sister product rather and so the Les Paul did the same thing and in the background they also had a big move and they moved from their Kalamazoo factory to Tennessee and this was in the mid 70s to the mid 80s that they did this transition. What was interesting there was the fact that the ex-employees of the factory in Kalamazoo stayed, came together and made a company called Heritage Guitars. And so they actually use the original building using the original machines and they make authentic period designs of well-known Gibson products. It's probably the best way to put it. So that's, that's, that's where Heritage Guitars came from. Um, and that was in 1984, 85, I believe. At the same time, incidentally, PRS, the guitar company, they formed so quite the 80s were quite a transitional period 
in the whole guitar industry with the changes from Fullerton, the changes to Kalamaz- from Kalamazoo and PRS coming in. You could argue now PRS, Gibson and Fender are, are the three biggest, bar none. You obviously have Ibanez, Yamaha, Gretsch, who is a Fender company, so the, are the, the really the biggest players out there. Sure, you have the Tokais and you have other guitars, Baum guitars, um, some more specialist ones like Novo, etc. But we, what we're talking about here is high volume. And in terms of high volume, Fender and its subsidiaries, so that's Fender, Gretsch and Squire, Gibson and its hip subsidiaries, um, which were Epiphone, Gibson, and I believe they also have a couple of others under their belt. Although they, there was a restructure recently, so who knows? But those those guitar companies um, have really changed over this time, over that '80s time period, and consequently that affected the music. Uh, you know, music goes in and out of fashion. We all know this. But the music of that time period, some of the older guitars that oh, people like Kurt Cobain were playing, for example were not popular back in the sort of late 80s, early 90s. Now they are very, very highly desirable. But at that time, not so much. Whereas the, the Stalwart, which was the Les Paul, the Strat, the Telecaster, they all had found their audience and found their places. Stratocasters in particular were quite well known for being a rounded product. You saw them from everything in modified in hair metal and or heavy metal or searing solos like uh, Eddie Van Halen who made his Frankencaster as he called it out of various parts right through to the pristine guitars played by someone like Clapton uh, Hendrix, Dave Gilmore so the, the Richie Sambora Bon Jovi you know across the board the, the Strat was very very well represented and on the other hand you had the Les Paul in the late 90, well, the 90s really, coming through from the likes of Slash at Guns N' Roses. It's pretty much the one of the main guys who people would aspire to in terms of a guitar solo, I think it's fair to say, of that generation. Sure, there were plenty of other bands, and plenty of other people playing. Mark Tremonti, for years, played Gibsons. He then went to PRS, and PRS made him a signature model, which is essentially the same as his old Gibson. So <laughs> there's, there's, you know, I won't say everyone's, everyone listens to what everyone else is doing and copies to a certain degree, but there, there's a certain amount of that within the guitar industry, as probably any industry is, to be fair. But when you look at a guitar, some people don't really appreciate from a guitar's perspective now I, I i have what you'd call gear acquisition syndrome I, I love getting new parts and new pieces of equipment new guitars new amps new pedals etc i love the experience of buying it and the hunt and researching it as much as actually playing it and that's one of the things certainly with guitars as a musical instrument that maybe separates it from a lot of the other instruments there is a whole, I want to say whole universe, but there's a whole ecosystem simply around the acquisition of the equipment. And not only the acquiring it, buying and selling of it, but also how to play it, how to get the best out of it. Um, recording studios, uh, tips and tricks. Obviously, YouTube is out there for everything now. But in particular, none so more more prevalent than probably playing the guitar uh, and that will have the effect of you know, more recent times from the pandemic in 2020 now we're in 2023 there's still a lot of people who are playing guitar now that three years ago have never touched one which is fantastic for music and creativity as a whole even if the guitar becomes their gateway to picking up a different instrument or finding a special skill set in an instrument it, it's it's the great entry point I sound like i'm encouraging everyone to buy guitars but <laughs> please do everyone go out and get one but guitars themselves people don't try them 
as often. That's the downside nowadays with distance and the, the, the distanced world that we often live in. So getting hands on with these instruments, more than some, you have to feel there's a, a connected part to that instrument. It has to feel like it's right in your hands. It's the right weight. It's the right length. Um, but the scale feels correct. So it doesn't feel too awkward for you. The way that the neck is shaped, the way the body feels weight wise, uh, the balance of it, how it is sitting down or standing up, as well as this is not just including how obviously it sounds and how it plays, but you've also got to think, is this going to inspire me? It does this inspire me to pick it up and play it. Sometimes it can feel like uh, Pokemon where you've got to collect them all. You've got to collect all the different types of guitar or pedal or iteration or color. And, and that's just part of the, the world that we're in now. But in truth, these are an instrument for, first and foremost, and they're there to make music, but to inspire you to play music. So a lot of the instruments that you'll see that are favored by you know, world famous musicians over the years, a lot of those are all, they're very connected to their instrument. And as we've spoken recently about people at Clapton who took the neck off of one guitar and put it onto the other one famously, or took six guitars and changed the components between three of them, swapped them through to make one specific guitar that he just found he gelled with. Dave Gilmore did exactly the same. It, that's very, very common with certain types of guitar, like a Fender. With something like a Gibson, it's much more specific to the instrument because you can't change the neck. And that's why I wanted to sort of just talk about guitars really today. Um, I, I love them. I, I could talk about them forever, but there are real nuances between each individual guitar. And that's what I'd love everyone listening today to get from this podcast is that when you hear or see someone who plays guitar or wants to get into guitar and they, they're enthused about specific pieces of equipment, it's not just the layer of excitement about buying something new. And but there is that, of course, but it's the potential for it to unlock a different strain of your creativity. And we always talk about music as like a third or fourth or fifth language for someone. And by having different pieces of equipment, it's almost like giving you access to a different type of vocabulary and having, instead of just your fundamentals changing, you've got a different accent on it or you've got a different flair to something. That's what it's really doing for you. So it's it's the condiments, the, the, the flavorings, as we say, maybe not the uh, the basics. The basics are all in the in the music theory, as much or as little as you feel comfortable learning. But having those little bits of flavoring and the equipment that makes you feel confident to do that and to really express yourself, you know, if that's that's the real key. So what makes up a guitar? Um, best way to do this, I guess, is you have acoustics. We can keep that, I would say, fairly simple. The acoustic or like classical guitar that people may be familiar with. If you think someone's strumming away at a guitar, there's no electrics plugged in at all. That's your basic acoustic. And the strings vibrate, vibrate the top of the wood. The air inside the, the guitar, the sound is formed and then it's pushed out that hole. And that's like the sound box, which pushes the air out and that's what amplifies it so you can hear it. That's it. You can get ones with microphones that they put a microphone inside or across that hole to capture the sound, to have a, an electroacoustic, so to speak. That's really it. That's, that's your basic structure there. The next one you have is what people would call a hollow body. And those are like an acoustic guitar, but instead of having a big sound hole, what they probably have is two pickups on the top and a couple of F holes, like a violin or a cello on the sides. So it is still a big empty cavity on the, on the inside and you still have that same, the top, it would be a, you know, a nice veneer that would vibrate and create a, the air movement. But the pickups would be making the noise. We'll come onto the pickups in a moment. And then you'd get to a semi-hollow, 
So a semi-hollow is different because a semi-hollow would be effectively a solid piece of wood in the middle. And then each side of that solid piece of wood would be an, a, an empty enclosure or an empty cavity. So think like a the block in the middle has got the two pickups on it or three or whatever it may be, one. But on either side, you've got two empty wings. And that's where you're getting a little bit of lightness, uh, it lowers the weight, different type of resonance in the guitar, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then finally, you come onto what everyone knows as a solid body. Pretty straightforward, solid piece of wood. Often made up of two pieces that are glued together, sometimes three, sometimes more. It depends on the actual construction site. Now, we're getting into the territory of. Uh, <laughs> internet people flaming so i will trade carefully in the next statements but we come on to materials that are used in, in the manufacture of guitars and for that i'm really going to focus on the solid bodies and the, the semi hollow with electric basically uh, acoustics have their own thing they've made it their own way because they have a bracing there is a, a skill to that and it's m made by a luthier uh, luthiers famously they make stringed instruments such as guitars but also mandolins bios violins cellos etc it's an art form there's a certain skill to it when you're looking at a semi or a solid there are still obviously <laughs> lots of skills involved but the actual wood and the type of wood that you choose uh, they're often different and they fall into generally a, a handful of categories the most famous guitars that are usually made, uh, ash, alder, mahogany, basswood, even pine. Those are the main ones that are used for bodies, typically. There's lots and lots and lots of other ones. PRS, for example, are very famous for having oh, all sorts of exotic, wonderful woods. But as a general rule, you often find a fender will be made from alder or ash, typically. And Les Pauls are usually made from mahogany. So weight-wise, that's why a Les Paul of a similar size to a Telecaster will be, they're a th although they're a thicker body anyway, they're a thicker body with a heavy material. They're usually maybe something like 10 pounds. You put a, a Stratocaster or a Telecaster, you may be looking at seven pounds. So there's a, there's a considerable difference weight-wise. Now, what some people have <laughs> argued for a long, 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 long time is the role that the wood that is chosen plays in making a sound. Now, that's <laughs> not the subjective part, but that's the bit where science has come into it. It does make a difference. But the differences are almost the sum of the parts rather than a very obvious where you you will find differences are things like the scale lengths fender have a longer scale length prs are in the middle gibson have a short scale length the way that they have 21 frets or 24 frets the difference that means that you've got four octaves on the guitar so you can access more notes the way in which a longer fretboard would it then mean that the pickups might be slightly close together means the difference between the two pickups or three pickups will be much more incremental than a, a very wide difference between a, a bass and a treble. Again, it's all down to the design. It's all down to the way in which each specific guitar is put together. And that itself is, is its own thing. You, if you have two bits of wood, they don't dry out the same way, even if they're made in the same factory at the same time, on the same day by the same machine. The wood is still different even from the same tree two different slices of wood will have slightly different densities it's just the way it is and if you can imagine all the elements that go into a guitar if every single one of those elements was even 0 0.001 of a percent different at the end of it two in brackets identical machines will be completely different completely different and there, there's so often you find 
we have we have a couple of strats here in the studio for example that are a few serial numbers apart so they've been bought on the same day same factory most likely by the same people assembled they they couldn't sound any more different or play any more different they use the same components they're the same fretboards and, and material and everything same string gauge same intonation just they're different they're just two different guitars um that's why the guitar hunting is is such a, a giant hobby uh, but anyway we'll go come into that in a moment moving on from the the woods of the body you have the woods on the neck the necks typically might be a maple backed neck or you might have a through mahogany neck if it's something like a, a firebird or a different type of a les paul they often have through necks that are put on and they them rather than bolt on uh, which has its own disadvantages but those themselves will be made of that one material of the body usually maple is very very common especially for fender but on the fretboard so on the side where all the frets are for those non-guitarists the big the nice little shiny lines that go up and down where the, near where the dots are the this side of it tends to be one of three or four these days materials you either have maple so you have a maple back neck and a maple on the top or you have rosewood on the top which is like the more darker brown color or you have ebony which is really really dark or more and more recently they were using power farrow and a lot of that was to do with rosewood having issues with being uh, indigenous to certain countries and you couldn't transport it um, becoming you know over for the forest deforestation the over the lumber being a sort of overused oversold etc so power farrow became something very very commonly used it has the the look of rosewood slash ebony but much more sustainable um, similar kind of feel to it so that's what brings me onto the <laughs> the topic about what the, the, the feel you know the woods or tone woods as people would call it in guitars it is a sum of everything if you have a maple neck they tend to feel brighter might not necessarily come out as brighter but they tend to feel brighter they also if they're maple on the fretboard they tend to be quite glossy now the gloss can wear over time but they generally tend to be quite glossy so they feel slippery or very slick to play this again leads to a, a lighter sound a brighter sound when you have rosewood it's a warmer feeling wood and you tend to get a warmer sound putting a two guitars again that's similar but one has rosewood one has maple some of the tests i've done you do feel what that rosewood is is a, a, a warmer sound but it also then lacks the the sharpness or the crispness that you would get from something which which is maple then this leads me on to it depends what material is in the body because if you have an ash body that will vibrate slightly differently to a mahogany body to an older body now they're all very similar and some people will use science to say well this is how a pickup works so why does the wood matter um, and that's a, oh, that's a nice segue to talking about pickups so for those who don't know how a pickup actually works the pickup is basically a series of magnets they've got a load of coils around them like wire wrapped and wrapped around it as a string vibrates it changes like the electric current the field because it makes a little current and that changes the field and the change in that field is what the sound wave is basically that's it so although we do hear a, a an audible buzz usually when, when you're playing an electric guitar that's not what you're, the, they're actually hearing now there were instant the instances where you can get what we call microphonic pickups where they ca they do almost act like a miniature microphone and, and work in that way but that's not what's happening for the majority of an electric guitar it's it's purely that you're moving a wire creating an, a different electric field and by shortening and lifting the string you that 
wire vibrates and resonates at a different frequency, which then creates essentially a different note. And on your strings, if we take a normal six string guitar, some people run what you call a nine gauge string and then a 10 gauge string on a Gibson. This is just the, thick, the thickness of the thinnest string or the first string as you call it. And that's just a typical thing. People have their own preferences. That's its, whole, that's its own animal itself. The consensus always was if you had a heavier string or a thicker string, you're gonna get a heavier, thicker sound. But also it does mean that it's not as light and easy to maneuver and, and manipulate on the actual fretboard. So someone, Billy Gibbons famously <laughs> played, I think sevens or eights, um, which are quite a very thin gauge guitar. And if you hear ZZ Top, he doesn't have a very thin sound. Likewise, there's other players who have very thick strings, Steve Ray Vaughan, and they have a very full sound. So, you know, which which, <laughs> which one do you want to sound like? It's, it's down to a personal preference, it, you know, finger saving and all sorts of things. But the strings themselves actually have a, their own a frequency that they resonate in. So if you ever use a tuner, whether it's a clip-on one like we have nowadays, or you have one through the foot pedal, the way in which your tune get, the string gets tuned is because it's purely looking for that harmonic resonance created by the break in that field from the string and the current over the magnets. So your first string is 300, 329 hertz. Whereas if you go to the thick string, it's only 80 hertz or 82 hertz. So you can see there's a great difference in the actual, the amount of vibration, the amount of energy in that string. So shortening that fretboard is what changes that. And that's where, you, that's where you get your note from and that's where you get the changes of the notes. Now, the intonation, which I mentioned earlier, is to do with the difference between what you call the nut at the very top near where the strings are and at the very end where the bridge is. I realize I'm, I'm putting my fingers out and doing this measurement for you, but none of you can see this. <laughs> but essentially the bit in between the guitar where it actually can, the string can move freely, can vibrate. That's what you're checking with the intonation. That, that length, that distance, you're making sure that the string can move freely and it's at the correct length. And if it's at the correct length, your string will be at the right pitch, at the right frequency. And that's what that's why you have guitar technicians who set up not only the height of the strings to make it easier or harder to play, depending on how you play, but also the, the way in which the strings sit against the fretboard and make sure obviously that intonation stays so that you remain in tune. So all of these touch points for the, the, the actual string itself have their own um, advantages and disadvantages is probably the best way to put it. Certainly the characteristics of a, a bone nut versus a graphite nut versus a plastic nut, for example, that they're quite well researched and put out there. The same as some people would argue in bridge. You can have a bridge, a brass saddle, you could have a steel saddle, you can have a wrap around tail piece. It all depends on how you play and what you're playing. And not, not that's why if you put on someone else's shoes, even if they're the same size foot, it doesn't quite feel right because they've moved certain bits inside the shoe that you, you, know, you couldn't see from the outside to, to tailor it just to themselves. And anyone who would pick my guitar up, they might say, oh, it sounds okay, but they, they would want to change how it plays. And if anyone who is playing guitar or whether you played it for a long time or you're new to it, I always encourage you to go to a professional and get a professional setup. Not just a, oh, my friend can do it, tweak setup. A professional, someone who has been playing for a very long time and they understand how to roll the edges of the fretboard. They understand how to properly intonate something based on the radius of, of the neck. Um, on the, the fretboard and obviously the, the shape of the neck take that into consideration they understand what type of music you want to play as well 
all of these things are how you set that guitar up specifically to that one person. So that's why we get so close to them because we, we really do connect with them in a really, really one-on-one -on -one scenario. So by all accounts, the hot topic of does a tone wood matter? I would say it does because you can't put, you can't put two guitars together and say they're the same. They're just not, you could never do that unless the guitars are made of materials that you can almost guarantee 100% are exact. You could never do that. There will always be impurities. There will always be slight differences in any manufacturing process. And anyone who's worked in or around any ma manufacturing. Fender, for example, as we mentioned, they're a, they're a parts manufacturer. They make thousands of necks a day that go into storage and then get used when, when each guitar is built. Gibson make thousands of guitars a day. Same, same principle, PRS, the same, Gretsch, the same. They all make these en masse. Sure, they do catch the ones that are broken or you know, maybe they don't occasionally. But even if they do, they all work to a tolerance. And that might be a half a mil tolerance, half a millimeter here or three eighths of an inch somewhere else, for example. There'll be certain things that they can't move on and there'll be certain things they allow a little bit of float. That's just general manufacturing, whether anyone likes it or not. And the level at which a machine does the manufacturing of the body in the USA, the same machine will be making it in Korea, the same machine can make it in Japan or Mexico or Europe or anywhere. If it's a, it's a CNC machine, it cuts out. That's how that's how things are mi machined now. So lots of people's argues about the quality of guitars, but what you're really comparing is different eras. We're now in a stage of automation that everything's on a mass manufacturer. If you want something really well hand built, go to an independent maker. It's as simple as that. There's um, lots of independents out there and some of the independents have really grown. Think of the Fano range going to Novo guitars and the popularity they have, for example. They're still not what you'd call a volume manufacturer. You have, you have to look at the, there's only a handful of those. Ibanez, volume, Yamaha, volume. And, and those are the ones that are, are really where the quality can be uh, different between e each individual guitar, should we say. So not only do you have what thickness of strings you have, you have what type of guitar it is. You have how the guitar is set up for you. You have what in individual components are on that guitar. And you also have the condition of those components. Now, there is a very popular relicking uh, trend in the last decade or so within the guitar community of having a guitar stressed uh, in, in terms of its looks, should we say. It looks very weathered and worn. And the road-worn effect is really I think the, the grading they have is looks like oh, occasionally it's had a little knock right up to this looks like it's being dragged behind a car and those relics uh, have their place but if anyone looks up Rory Gallagher or Stevie Ray Vaughan uh, or modern time someone like Philip Sace you look at the way in which their guitars are worn uh, and you can tell that that guitar's had an absolute beating because it's being played live and it's basically being sweat on <laughs> and the guitar is being used as a tool in passion. And because of that, it's it, they're hitting the strings hard, they're, they're wearing big buckles and things on their, you know, not just uniforms, I was going to say, but on their actual stage outfits that rubs all everything off, that chips off paint, they put things on the amp or throw it on the floor and they don't, even if they're not 
purposely trying to damage it. These are working instruments. And that's where the relic thing came from, really. People seeing it as a, a badge of honor in a way. They do look cool. I, you, know, you can't say they don't. Maybe the the heavy relicking, as a personal preference, is, is not for me. But I, I have got a couple of guitars in that are heavy relics. And for what they're supposed to be, they, they look on point. But the way that you can have crackle glaze now, the different types of finishes on guitars. I mean, we, we didn't really cover finishes, but ultimately there's two types, a, a polyurethane phase or a nitro. Um, the best way to think of it is nitro is very like a thin skin that could be worn away, but it is a bit toxic. It's not the nicest to, to play around with. Or poly is, really, you know, strats probably encompass a poly body the, the best. In the same way, Nitro, you probably think of a, a Les Paul in the terms of that they just, one has a thin skin and it's really highlighting the woods coming through. And then a poly is usually a flat color and it's thick. Uh, and you know, you could drop the guitar. If you drop it, you take a chip out of the poly, you wouldn't damage the wood. Whereas, so you know, there's a level of protection there. At the same time, that will never wear out the poly. So you could have a poly guitar for 20 years and it won't really look damaged unless you chip it. Whereas 20 years hard playing on a, a Les Paul or a nitro finished Fender or Tele, etc., you'll you'll see that wear. That wear will be coming straight through. And that really is it. Sure, you have the, the connectors on guitars, you have the, the jack plug where it goes in on, on different guitars are in different places they're all usually the same sort of thing the same as the electrics although you have humbuckers and you have single core pickups which we didn't cover but if you got this far you know what a single coil is a humbucker is simply two single coils but one's reverse wound in a different phase which means it cancels the other out or cancels the hum or bucks the hum hence humbucker and that's it really uh, incidentally i didn't realize that the 60 cycle hum is purely a lot to do with mains power that's that's why it picks up so you can get rid of that by using isolators i never really knew that i always just thought it was always there but that was me coming from someone who played humbuckers most of my life coming to single coils has been uh, a, a journey <laughs> but a, a good one fun one so getting back to the, the actual types themselves, you have lots of different pickups, you have lots of different woods, you have lots of different setups, lots of different ways in which anything can be slightly different. And just that fraction of a difference will come through when, when the same person plays two, in brackets, identical guitars. And a luthier I know said to me once he had a gentleman instruct him I like the look of this guitar and the way it plays but I like the sound of this guitar so can you swap over these components which he did and the result was two awful guitars <laughs> so a guitar is always the sum of its parts and sometimes it it's only when it's all together that it works and if it's not working for you, sometimes you can just replace that component and that'll make a difference. Um, particularly changing pickups or changing the quality of the other electrical components, which are the volume and tone pots or the switches. Changing those can have substantial differences. Certainly, if you look online, you'll see a lot of people taking their factory products and using the like of I don't know, James's Home in a Tone or Monty's or um, any one of the hundreds of equipment makers who will pre-make. Certainly if you look on the stories online, you'll find lots of people who use uh, pre-made wiring harnesses and those can come from any sort of places, whatever country you're there listening to, 
there'll be someone who makes pre-wired. It, certainly in the UK, you've got people like uh, Monty's, James Sahona Tone, I think the Creamery do some as well. Um, there are others that obviously do it online. I just can't think of any off the top of my head. But the important thing is you can take a guitar if almost all the parts are where you need it to be and you can modify it to make it yours. Which you know, solidifies my argument that every guitar is, is different and offers something to the person playing it. So if you are ever buying secondhand guitars, sure you're inheriting the way someone else has set something up, but on the flip side, you're getting to listen to something through someone else's ears in a way, and that, that's kind of a nice experience. It's a nice way to do things. Um, but some guitars get off to get modified to the point where they're very specialist, and, and that's a different thing. But I definitely encourage people to go out and get used equipment. And this is not just applying for guitars, this is drums, keyboards, everything. Get used stuff. Um, I certainly know from the guitar side of things, if a guitar has been played, it's a good guitar. If a guitar looks pristine it, and it's quite old, and it's not really being played unless it's purposely being neglected, it's probably not that nice to play. And part of the reason is because it hasn't been played. So guitars need to be worn in. They need to have a little bit of um, smoothness on the fretboard edges, for example. And that's one of the things that this relicking that people take on can do. It can pre-wear your guitar so it feels like it's been a, a pre-worn shoe, so to speak. You don't have to stretch it out. It's already kind of there, ready to go. I believe Porsche famously used to pre-stress all their engines so that from day one, you could just turn the car on and go flat out 100 miles an hour and not have to worry about a run in time. Normally it was, you know, a thousand miles, you got to take the, let the car settle and bed it. And Porsche used to pre-stress that as part of their testing phases many years ago. I don't know if that's still the case now. But if you think of a guitar or any instrument, I'd imagine in that way, it needs to bed in. So when you see someone or anyone that you know, or it might be you that has three, four, five guitars, there's a reason for that. And it's not just because they're a hoarder. That is part of it, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> and it's always nice to have nice shiny things. But they all have a different voice and they all allow you to add some flavor to the language of music. And if you imagine it as like a, another tool to help you interpret what's going on inside you and allow it to come out, it's another conduit for that. And that's what the different types of guitar are and the different modifications and the different ways of doing things. So for guitars, really, that's it in a nutshell. So many, so many really detailed avenues we could go down and hopefully in some of the guests we've got coming on, we can go down those avenues. Uh, there's a couple of people I can think of who've got custom guitars built and very expensive equipment, but they also play quite reasonable equipment for a lot of their main shows because it's reliable and they know it works and they know what they can get from it. We also haven't mentioned effects pedals or guitar amps. And just to touch briefly on those for anyone who is either new to this or wants just wanting to learn a bit more. When the signal comes out of the guitar, you'd often imagine it goes straight to an amplifier. And that is the case for some people. And the guitar amplifier will either be a solid state, which is like a circuit board, or it'll be a tube amp. And the tube are like vacuum tubes or valves that we call them. And what it is, is it's like a hive, it's some electrodes placed in a high vacuum cylinder. Looks a bit like a light bulb, best way I can put it. And when the signal goes into the amplifier, the signal goes across those electrodes and you control the current, which in turn creates the signal. Because there is a difference in that, to the initial signal that's coming from your guitar 
try to stay with me here <laughs> because it adds a little coloring to that signal tube amps are often considered to have a warmth to them which a solid state amp will not a solid state amp will simply take the signal that comes from your guitar and put that straight to the speaker and that will be amplified to you know whatever volume you need a tube amp colors it as the signal passes across the tubes to go to the amplification stage it gets colored now the coloration takes place in what they call a preamp and the power amp so the preamp is the section before all of the eqs quite often and that being the bass middle treble or the gain stages etc then you have what you call the power amp and the power amp's the bit that is going to push the speaker and give you volume now when you hear the Jimi hendrix the jimmy pages of this world and they've got a giant amplifier and they've got it absolutely turned up to 10 or 11 is the jam i say those are an amp on full tilt that's everything's opened up and they didn't have to use other types of pedal to make really really big noises or squealy noises or lead solo noises or fuzzy kind of noises they didn't need to have any of that because they had a giant amp pushing lots of air and the interaction between lots of current going through with those tubes and pushing the air that interaction made different har harmonics and different sounds when you're at play at lower volumes like a lot of people do nowadays and in clubs or venues or even the studios you're limited by certain sounds in those instances you can't push those speakers to that point where you get that tone in which case people will use a foot pedal or an effects pedal and that will often sit between the guitar and the amplifier so those pedals could be used for gains or overdrives so the distorted sound it might be to compress it to tighten the sound up or it might be like a modulation which can sometimes sit in between the pre and the post amp in a, in a separate kind of loop and that would be for like your modulations like choruses and delays or reverbs so if we wanted to have a, a lovely long sort of echo 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 sorry i've always wanted to press that button we wanted to do something like that or you have a delays and giant reverbs modulation takes a, a nice swirly whooshy sound along with choruses and flanges all of those kind of things can be done before it obviously gets to the amplifier and then the amplifier pushes that out so that's where pedals and effects come in now truthfully when you practice you don't really use them unless you're practicing a specific song and there's timing of activating those used but for most practice you won't use those sort of things you just literally want to get a, a basic tone or a bass tone and then practice from there but the pedals themselves there's whole communities whole ecosystems out there just dedicated to analog pedals which are made by hand hand wired circuitry versus again pcbs and digital circuits both have their drawbacks both have their advantages more often the analog tends to be more expensive because it's hand wired and they have a very specific sk skill that the pedal might do for example digital you tend to have a lot more flexibility and you often have a, a greater um, availability with digital sizes as well they, they can be small to very large units so all of these things they have the amps on their own pedals on their own let alone the guitars they all have their own communities and their own ecosystems but what everyone shares is the whole love of not just not just the actual music itself but the process of making music and capturing music and that's the bit that we want to encourage here that's the bit that that's the bit i love and that's what you know we want to do and share it with people who not only are professional musicians but are hobbyist musicians budding musicians <laughs> 
and, and I think it's a it's a beautiful thing to be able to speak to someone from a different place or a different time and music is such a, a language it's so universal that everyone will understand it um, to communicate happiness sorrow joy excitement etc and I think for, for speaking personally that's what the guitar does that many instruments don't is that there's a, a level of connection to a guitar because of the way that you hold it and almost like cuddle it <laughs> the intimacy that you need in the way that you need to hold the neck and play the guitar um, there's not many other instruments that have that level of connection where you it, you surround that instrument um, pianos obviously get very close to that but you, people don't often have 10, 15 pianos, certainly not of grand piano sort of size. Whereas with guitars, having five five guitars sounds about the average these days. But let me know what you think. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear what if you know if you are interested in guitar, just drop us a line. If you want to learn any more, if I can help in any way, we'll do so. But what instruments do you play? How do you find that you connect to those instruments, and how do you? think they interpret that language of music that we're all sort of striving to become fluent in <laughs> but that's pretty much it for this show thank you so much for sticking with me if you got this far legend totally appreciate it if you do play an instrument once you finish this up go out and grab it and uh, even just spend 10-15 minutes just lose yourself in a little bit of fun Thank you so much for joining me. My name's Mark. A bit pleased to host you today. Next show's coming up. will be next week. Until next time, wherever you are, wherever you're listening, thank you so much.